Welcome to GUI and in web browsers uh, for the 4th of March 2020. I'm joined by regular folks. Those are new regulars, guys. Um, now let's take a look at our agenda. Uh, I've added, uh, yeah, I think I've added the first one so I can start and then uh, feel free to add anything else uh, you feel we should discuss this week. So uh, the item I've added is about window IPFS. And the, the, back, the background is that JS IPFS and JS IPFS HTTP client uh, both switched to uh, async iterables, um, which changed uh, the programmatic API that people use in uh, JavaScript if they switch to the latest JS APFS and uh, corresponding HTTP client. The problem is uh, IPFS companion is exposing uh, as an experiment. We are exposing um, a programmatic interface on window object called IPFS. And you, if you have IPFS companion installed, it will inject that API endpoint to a page and a page can request uh, activation for that interface for a specific commands. And what, basi what ha basically happens behind the scenes, there's like a proxy between a web page and the AP IPFS API used by IPFS companion. That could be embedded JS IPFS running in a browser extension um, or a remote HTTP API. That could be a localhost API provided by Go IPFS or IPFS desktop. Um, so on, on some level, we don't really control the version of that API that IPFS uh, companion connects to. Uh, generally, IPFS Companion has some uh, uh, fixes that make when we historic when we historically had the breaking changes to files APIs, uh, some commands got moved from uh, files API uh, like IPFS files uh, namespace to the top level namespace. We've added uh, aliases, so no matter which version of API is in the background. Uh, the programmatic interface exposed to the web page would still work as expected. The problem is now we made even more breaking changes to, with that uh, async refactor, and now it's no longer like possible to uh, programmatically detect what uh, like the web page wants. A uh, web page may expect the old version of IPFS CAT, uh, and now. Uh, or it may expect a new version, which should return async iterable, like reported on this issue, uh, but it does not because IPFS companion is still using the old version of JS IPFS HTTP client, and that client is exposing the old programmatic interface. Uh, that bit long uh, background uh, was like necessary to understand uh, the question I posed on, the, on this issue. Uh, so basically, the question is, should we disable IPFS, uh, window IPFS until support for those new APIs lands? And what I mean by uh, support landing, basically we need to switch IPFS companion to new JS IPFS and JS IPFS HTTP client, which use those new APIs anyway. It's just we, namely me, had no bandwidth uh, in this quarter uh, for doing that. So we postpone that to Q2, sort of. There's like open issue for tracking that migration if anyone is interested. Uh, the problem remains right now if a website is using uh, window IPFS and the way people are using window IPFS object, uh, they check if it's present and opportunistically they try to use it. If it fails for some reason, then they can like fall back to uh, spawning their own node or using ex like external HTTP API. However, like usually if the window IPFS is present, the website tries to use it. 
So the idea is to, uh, so right now, it tries to use it and it breaks, which is pretty bad. So the idea is to uh, push a backlist release of IPFS companion that would uh, simply uh, stop exposing window IPFS and make it like grayed out, blacked out in preferences with a note that we are in the progress of migrating to new API. Um, that's not like very severe change because I don't feel a lot of people uh, rely like 100% on this. It's mostly like opportunistic. If someone is running a node, it's nice for people to use their local node instead of spawning uh, JSIPFS for fetching uh, data. But it's still a significant change. Uh, the question is, should we do it? I'm open to opinions. So could we like chain with, instead of like disabling, could that be a thing for like detection where they check like the IPFS version? Could we uh, make that recommendation? Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the thing. Uh, right now, they, if you are a uh, website developer, you can execute IPFS version command to tell the version of the backend daemon. However, we don't really have a way of checking the version of a HTTP client or JSIPFS. So those are two different versions, right? Which expose the same core interface. Um, and I don't think it's a burden that we should push to developer because that would require like developer to know, oh, those versions of JSIPFS and JSIPFS HTTP client expose this version of programmatic interface. Like we don't have any versioning of the programmatic interface actually. Like we have the core interface, which is like released. Um, but I'm not sure if that's like an abstraction that we should like expose to developers. Um, when we started window IPFS experiment, the API was basically like one-to-one -one with HTTP API without any fancy bells and whistles. And the assumption was it's sort of like a static beast. And it will, when we make a breaking change, that would be like API v2, v1. And with that, we would probably introduce some versioning scheme. Uh, but right now, I, we don't have a, a means of doing that. Versioning the core API with something called a specification sounds like a great long-term plan to me. Yeah, because like we talked, uh, yeah, like we mentioned before, I started the recording. Uh, a lot of people rely on JS, and like JS itself introduces this abstraction of programmatic interface, effectively becoming a separate API that we need to like cater to and maintain. Um, the, the problem is in companion, we don't have any means and like people don't check the daemon version when we made like a changes to uh, fa the way like IPFS add handled something. Like people were not even able to uh, ver account a version of Go IPFS for working around that. So. Uh, this is even worse. Yeah, when you say people can't, don't check the, the daemon version though, like who, who, who are these people? Are these people that are using JSIPFS, either the HTTP client or yeah, core yeah, so, yeah. to so connect to a local daemon? Yeah, so basically when you use IPFS API, you got a version command. But that does not do what probably people think that it does. It returns a version of the implementation that could be a version of Go IPFS or JS IPFS. And it returns a version of protocol, which is always the same, like 0 0.1. Um, it does not return a version of, uh, yeah, it does not return any version that could be bound to that programmatic interface 
Uh, I think that's the... So yeah, the version doesn't match whatever the set of API and, and, and the semantics of the API and behavior of the API. Yeah, what's worse, we could, yeah, what's worse you can point uh, diff, like older uh, version of HTTP client and the new async iterator version of HTTP client to the same HTTP API. And like the, the daemon version will be the same, but the JS program, like the programmatic interface for JS would be different. Um, so, that's so yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think your, but I think your idea about versioning the the programmatic API really makes a lot of sense. Like that's the if that's the the one that's the main compatibility point that developers are going to use. Uh, that's the place where there, there's going to be problems if API differs or behavior changes. Yeah. Even though is API semantics stay the same. So I think versioning the programmatic API re really makes a lot of sense. And uh, if unless there's any changes, you know that you see, they're going to be big to that to that set of so APIs, I mean, it might just really resolve the issue for a while. We know we can depend on that bit. Yeah, so. Uh, and then the, IPFS, you know, require IPFS2 later on down the road, right? Yeah, like in the long term, we could like extend the, just the version command. We go to like the, the daemon, the protocol, we could add like, add like programmatic interface version as a third thing. Uh, the problem is solving the problem at hand, which is, Companion breaks websites who rely on window IPFS because the API changed. Um, yeah, but do we, so we, we know there are 25,000 installs of companion. Yeah. I, and I, I guess my, my concern here is that we might be over rotating on a fairly small set of people that we probably have pretty high level of communication with. Yeah. The, the question is, should maybe the, the question is not should we disable or should we do anything until we uh, refactor companion to use the new API? Maybe that's the better question. Yeah, I, I think that's a more pragmatic question. Uh, just one thing. So if we disable it, it will break the apps as well, right? Because oh, there... No, no. Actually, no? the way people use a window IPFS is like opportunistic thing. So they check if it's present. If it's present, they will use it. If it's missing, they will spawn their own JS IPFS or they will run their own HTTP client to some remote API. So it won't, like if window IPFS disappears, that will not break apps. Generally, yeah, unless the code's just pretty bad. But uh, again, I feel like we're talking about still a, a pretty small number of people. Yeah, the problem is uh, more... If we remove it and stuff breaks, then we'll know a little bit more about those people. <laughs> yeah, so it's more about optics because like people who use IPFS Companion are probably the most passionate about IPFS project and they are the people who will test those apps who probably have support, this opportunistic support. So it's I, like, the, the, I worry about this overlap. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd really, I'd want to dig into who those people are, though. Like, if they're the most passionate users and they're the ones who are debugging this and these are the developers, then, then they're the ones who are also going to read our, our blog post where you talk about this change or the one who are going to read the, the, where we tweet about it or the forum where you post about it. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to make too many assumptions around levels of usage, correlate those with number of installs, and like if you seem to be referring to specific implementations where you've seen people do this in their code, we should be able to detect that to some extent on, on GitHub by doing repo and code searching and figure out who the list of projects are that are, say, looking for window.ipfs in their, in their JavaScript or web, web content. Um, yeah, and we, we also have this project called IPFS Provider, which is like a fallback. You can define fallbacks and uh, window IPFS is what also like implicitly enabled, I believe. So we can check who uh, depends on that. Um, yeah. But it so, sounds like removing it, even the cost of removing it, according to you, is just not gonna be really that high. The bigger challenge is making sure that we have an adoption pathway and migration pathway that remains smooth. So with developers who are adopting now, they don't have to do too many changes or jump through too many hoops moving forward. Yep. Um, should we remove it for now and then when we introduce it, we introduce it with like that versioning. So it's more or less future proof somehow. 
Doesn't Zoom have polls? Can you can you start a poll right now, and then we can all. <laughs> There's a pause button, but uh, when I, I press it, it, when I press it, the window opens, and then I need to create a poll in my web browser. Oh really? <laughs> it's fun. It's That's fun. comedy. It's comedy. <laughs> no, let let me like create yes and option two no. Does it uh, show up in the chat? Should it be multiple choice? No, I will make it single choice. <laughs> no, I will make it multiple choice just for Ooh, nice. comedic effect. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, I wonder if it's anonymized or can you see everybody else votes? Okay, this is kind of derailing. I definitely, I think it's probably totally fine to remove window.mpfs for now. It's, it's like, did anything happen? Because I pressed no. something. All right, this does not work. Thanks, Zoom. Uh, apologies to people who are watching this on YouTube and other places. Uh, we should do better next time. Uh, I will end this topic <laughs> and let's provisionally say that, yeah, probably we should uh, remove it for now. And then we'll uh, have a separate discussion about versioning programmatic interface in a way that developers can actually use um, right um, next one functional configuration of js lip p2p yeah so in terms of like usability of lib p2p we've been looking at like how we can make configuration easier um, we did talked of, about a myriad of, of options um, and last night I had some thoughts that I wrote down in this issue on um, using functional configuration for IPFS. So I think there are a lot of potential wins to doing this. Um, it solves a, should solve a lot of problems. It should allow us to export um, configurations um, as well as look at like what improvements we can make in terms of like actionable errors. So if I do an NPM install lib P2P, and then I import one of these configs from the lib P2P package on lib P2P.create, because I want a browser package or I want a node package. And then I don't install any other packages, but I do you know, try to run that, like getting actionable errors that say, hey, run this NPM install command to get all the packages that you're missing. So kind of like guiding people for that as well as like supporting users who want to do more complex configuration. Um, and I think this will also allow us to do things that we've been wanting to do for a while in terms of like splitting up the DHT into putting it in content routing and a peer routing and to peer discovery. Like we'll be able to split up those components and have that configuration function live in the DHT repo. So as modules are created, if they need any complex setup, they'd be able to just like export their own configuration functions for users to, to do and, and compose the P2P. So there is a proposal in that issue that's linked in the notes. Um, if you have comments or opinions, uh, please, please share. This is super useful because I've been, uh, on the receiving end of the current like version where of the current way we overwrite lib p2p uh, configuration in js ipfs uh, and i think I, yeah I, right after you posted it i i, I linked uh, uh, the changes we've made in js ipfs to make it a little bit le less painful um, and i'm in IPFS Companion, I'm overriding a lot of stuff in the default configuration for Brave because that's a tricky, uh, tricky runtime for which we had no template. We have like a browser defaults and the node defaults, but Brave is a browser with TCP transport and MDNS discovery. So we like I had to basically write a custom, uh, custom configuration with custom list of transports and discovery methods. Um, and it's like already a bit better on the JS IPFS side, but I, I agree uh, it's still tricky, especially like um, that, not sure if it's like not derailing too much, but uh, the thing that's always 
uh, felt icky to me was the way WebSocket star, WebRTC is kind of fine. We only like pass pure ID to, to the constructor, but WebSocket star historically had like a pretty bad uh, additional steps in uh, JS IPFS uh, related to basically like replacing uh, multi others with, with uh, WebSocket star ones. Um, not sure if it's something we can address in while we make it this refactor, but it certainly a, sounds like a problem not only I would have, because uh, I, I imagine a lot of people who want to run a custom config, they probably want to run the custom config with uh, like something like WebSocket star or a custom list of uh, transports, uh, and they, that's the first problem they hit. So it's super useful to, uh, yeah, at least at least look at, at uh, that as a prior art uh, for potential use. Yeah, and so I think that like the JS, JS IPFS config is like that most complicated config that we know to date. Um, so I think if we can, we can build a configuration in a way that makes that just like, okay, this just works now. Like we just have to add like maybe specific stuff around like listen and announce addresses. Um, but that should also be done as like a customization function of here are the listen and addresses so that everything is just those specific functions and we should have like stuff just built out of the box um, to do that. So ideally I would like even like the stuff that we need for the JS IPFS config, most of that should be able to exist in like a prepackaged customization function in libp2p so then JSIPFS would just need to import libp2p, pass that specific configuration function, and like maybe one or two other small functions, and then just get the instance that way. Yep. Probably uh, we'll need to take another pass at your notes uh, and revisit my mine from Brave. Because um, I feel I had like more pain points. It was just like a super quick. Uh, yeah, I, I need to do a pass at it as well. I wanted to get it out of my brain because I woke up at 3 a.m. and for some reason thought about libp2b configuration. So I had to jot down some things and then go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's su super, super awesome, awful, but also awesome way of <laughs> falling asleep, <laughs> waking up and falling asleep. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, JS, uh, JS lib P2P configuration uh, uh, will improve. Uh, yeah, I will also have a, a look at your proposal this week, Jeff. Yeah, because uh, like, uh, I would, yeah, I, I would, I wonder if like web socket Stardust would uh, have the similar challenges with that additional code that had to be kind of run outside of lib P2P. Um, and really, it, none of that should need to exist anymore with the new version. Like we can see like, if something like that still needs to happen, we can go back and look and like, okay, what's what's going on? Because even with the current, current configuration, you shouldn't need to do that. Because one of the things we did in the refactor is now we do whenever we instantiate transports, we pass lib P2P anyway. Okay. As part of the configuration. Oh, okay. yeah, so transports that, can go get lib P2P, pull the ID, pull the addresses, do anything they need to do. Yeah, all right. That, then that's probably solved. Cool. All right. Should we review browser and connectivity metrics? Uh, specifically, can we measure in browser nodes in any way? Uh, should I share my screen with the or do yeah, you want sure. to Yeah, I wanted to just through, go through real quick and validate these and see if these made sense, if they uh, if they were possible, uh, and ask for you all to add any notes there around where uh, how we would hook up the data source. So if there's a way to say programmatically uh, do companion installs, uh, add a add a, a link there to notes um, for some of these other ones. Just add, add a link if you know if there's any data sources available already, and then we can hook them up into Grafana. <clears throat> um, I'm looking at adding Grafana uh, 
plugins that make it as easy as possible for you to do that without us having to, you know, spend spend lifetimes um, in in YAML that we can't get back. Um, so re reducing the pain of wiring some of these up. But I think that um, the the core, the most important thing for me is whether or not any of these makes sense for measuring how how we're getting to our goals in overall in browsers connectivity land. So what are the most important bits for us are. And I think part of that comes to, you know, some of this understanding there's, there's specific shorter term goals, like getting a uh, bootstrap uh, node load decreased, um, getting relay users to zero or, or whatever, right? Uh, or WS star users to zero. So things like that are shorter term, but those don't necessarily speak to the longer term impact that we want to have, which is higher levels of connectivity for increasing numbers of people using IPFS from web pages. Um, so I'd, I'd really, I need you, you, all of your help in, in figuring out what the right way to understand and measure that. And, um, you know, I think Ollie was talking about um, the way, or the stuff that they're doing for like DHT crawling and things like that to be able to measure the size of the DHT and the ability to <clears throat> see, uh, have some view into number of in-browser nodes. So if, if GSIPFS nodes running in HTTP web pages are connecting, uh, and and connecting to other peers, uh, having a view into what what that means from a is 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 that number growing? Is that number decreasing? Um, I, there's probably some wrinkles around, like uh, the work that Three Box is doing, and I'll talk about that in the next one of these next items um, around how to collapse node usage across tabs. So you got one, you got 18 tabs open with uh, some with somehow one shared JSIPFS instance between um, some of the stuff that Rockley was doing with Lunet, some of our partners who are having increasing deployment sizes like three box are really having to push hard on solving that problem, which of course then collapses the number of users. I guess it's still the same individual person using it. So maybe that's not such a big deal, but you know, understanding what the numbers actually mean from that standpoint. But let me know if there's, if any of these things seem like either they're not worth measuring or they're impossible to measure. Definitely let me know. And then from that, like, what are the, what are our, what's our end goal? What does it look like when browsers and connectivity group is winning? Does that look like some number of, of connections from individual and users in browsers is, is actually increasing? Uh, does it look like number of connection options increase? If we had DHT, it would be easier because you just crawl the DHT and you look at multi others. Uh, <laughs> no, we we need to figure it out. Uh, we'll we'll sleep on this idea. Okay, Al Alex said DHT in the fall. So I thought we had just agreed in in Brooklyn to not make a decision about DHT and JavaScript in the fall. But Alex said no. He, he's like, no. The idea was we'll just implement it in the fall, and then we'll be done. I was like, yeah. okay, okay, I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah, we were in the same room, and everyone went out from that room with the decision they really liked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought my I, my understanding of the decision was conservative. I just thought we were delegate we were pushing off the decision itself. We pushed it off, and then Alex decided. <laughs> <laughs> I, I we did find out yesterday that three box is using JSIPFS on the server as well, uh, and it was it was an interesting conversation. And we'll roll some of this up in the collabs report, but. Uh, it was interesting in that, that they had some perceptions around capability of Go versus Go IPFS versus JS IPFS that seemed rooted a little bit in kind of the attitude of the project as a whole around like Go as the official implementation um, and a perceived sense of lack of support for certain things in JavaScript and a not clear roadmap from them in understanding what level of capability or support JS IPFS is going to get in the future. So I feel like there's... Um, like we, we're finding more more users of the software of where our, we already make that we didn't know were users of our software, even though they're very close collaborators. And um, more more view into that will be you know uh, getting their feedback on things like whether or not uh, DHT support would make or break their use case would would be good. Right now they have a pretty constrained use case, so it it's not really a problem for them. It's actually really similar to what Microsoft is doing. Uh, where most of their clients just swarm connect directly to them anyway, or, uh, so it's not not a big deal. But they want to they want to they actually want to 
to grow and be more decentralized in a way that they don't need that as a as a crutch. Yeah, absolutely. And I sort of I had a call with uh, Terminal Monday uh, specifically around uh, challenges in the browser context, and uh, they probably will be pushing the boundaries that were visited uh, by Iraqli's Lunet pro project at some point. It feels like the problem of uh, uh, like multiple instances in multiple tabs or multiple repos, repos per origin, how do you share repo or, or like entire JSIPFS instance across different websites uh, that use the same like library or how do you bootstrap websites for just like having static page with CAD somewhere, somewhere and a small library. Uh, pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, still the limitation of web browser context, uh, web sockets, uh, web RTC not working in service workers, uh, problems like that. Uh, so we, we will definitely continue uh, talking with them because they are still trying to figure it out uh what's possible and uh, like that will also feedback to the decision they make and we want to be uh, at least acting as a guidance for uh, for what will be possible on the ipfs side in the short term long term when the dht lands how useful it will be if every multi other is tcp1 uh things like that that uh, can is there an issue, or in, are we distributed yet for WebRTC and service workers? Are we tracking uh, that request in a way that all, all our partner projects can hop in and make their needs? I believe, yeah, I believe there's like one, uh, there are at least two issues about uh, WebRTC. One is about sort of like a state of the art, and it's like all the issues, not only that one. And yeah. the separate one is about like uh, WebRTC next generation, which is like yeah. uh, over, over quick and things like that. Yeah. So that like two uh, two issues. I'm just kind of wondering, like you know, we heard we've three box talked about this, so like we've kind of jumped to the next issue there. So mm -hmm. definitely take away before we hardcore switch away from metrics. Please review those metrics. Add any notes you have around data sources for them, and then we can we can uh, work on getting those hooked up. But from the from the you know, I added an issue around both terminal and three box because they're talking about these same problems. Um, they're talking about things like multiple nodes inside a single browser when you get a bunch of tabs open. Uh, they're talking about the uh, connection limitations, things like what RTC and service workers came up in conversations with both of them. Um, so making sure that we can use places like are we distributed yet as a multi multi party way of people raising their hand and saying I need this. Uh, and then we can point standards groups to that when we go and talk to those groups. Um, and then I think also really even even envisioning. I feel like there's a nascent opportunity for us to envision the non DHT ways of people that are connecting over WebRTC, the way that uh, MetaMask is doing, the way that WebTorn is doing. There are a number of approaches for really building large client-only networks over WebRTC that we kind of haven't really been taking advantage of. Um, and I, I don't have enough visibility into why, why that is, or is it just lack of resources or experimentation, or have we already evaluated these? We say these won't work as, as alternate lib P2P transports that'll run over WebRTC that are not DHT. Um, so, and people's thoughts on that would be really interesting. I just remembered Hugo's experiments with DNS and the discussions we had on like sharding a DHT on uh, D DNS records. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Ship it. Yeah. Let, let, let's sleep on that one. How come everything I bring up you say we need to sleep on? Because this call is just one hour, and each topic is another hour. <laughs> but yeah, I, those, those are great, uh, great ideas. Yeah, I, I just keep bringing up little asks, like please reinvent or throw away or burn the DHT down. What? <laughs> yeah, small things. Uh, what about uh, Madrid in July? Uh, yeah, just uh, so I, I linked the PL event issue there. Um, you know, the, both the research team, ResNet, and us all pulled back from from ITF one to seven because it was just too close. But 
we do want to have a, um, a more concerted effort and presence around 108. Uh, we, they were kind of talking about things like running a social or a meetup, like people who are interested in this kind of stuff and have it be kind of a birds of a feather type of, of meetup for 108. Um, but uh, we'll probably, because this group in particular, it would be great to have your presence. Uh, if you look through like the 107 schedule of sessions, there's just so many sessions that are relevant to us. So uh, definitely maybe mark this period down on your calendar and put a hold just in case, um, because we'll probably want to combine a, a browser connectivity hack week along with, with all or part of, of this meetup. Hopefully travel restrictions will have be, be less by that point. Um, and uh, for a lot of you, this is some fairly close, close travel, not too crazy. Uh, just Jacob and I have a longer road to get over there. Nope, I'm in Germany. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm the only you're the one. only one. I feel so left out. <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> uh, I was not going to break your dream, but well, <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of the ocean. Yeah, man. This this side is much cooler. <laughs> Time to come. Uh, well, All right. Let's see. What's the next? I think I have the next one too. Co-hosting. Co-hosting. Don't let the dream die. Um. I saw this thread from data hoarders on Reddit talking about uh, suppression of, of COVID-19 news in, in China. One of the you know, things that we have, maybe we even talked to Matters News. It would be interesting to talk about how we can support them. But co-hosting seems like uh, we still, we keep coming up with these use cases for co-hosting that seem like would be interesting experiments in how we can use the browser to be able to make it easy for people to publish from, from, uh, publish from old web to IPFS. Uh, every time there's a situation like this where there's the data suppression at scale, um, it's even starting to happen in the U.S. a little bit. It's really, uh, it's an opportunity for us to be able to like, say, look at the power of these tools that, that we've built. Uh, with co-hosting, we had some experimentation in the last fall. See, so like, on top of MFS, how can we build things on top of MFS so that it require protocol level changes, that it require API level or core level changes, but I'll really, like, smooth the kind of user onboarding and flow for being able to republish web content to IPFS and then uh, read it and collect it back. So I, I feel like we, we kind of set this, we explicitly set this aside, um, but the use cases for, for this type of functionality continue to continue to increase, especially this idea of like auto co-hosting small bits here and there as you're, as you're browsing where people, users opt in for a specific use case. Um, it, it, maybe this is something we write up as a grant, might be an interesting idea. But there's probably a little bit of work there around, you know, testing and making sure that the the scenario actually like getting the the basic flow working first. In case someone, uh, in case someone is watching this and thinks, oh, I could maybe hack on this, uh, there is IPFS Shipyard co-hosting repo, which is just like a description of the experiment. Why are we making the experiment? Uh, there is a specification for co-hosting, basic operations, adding, removing, listing. Uh, everything is more sort of like a conven convention over configuration. So it's just like a set of convention for where you put uh, snapshots and how do you tell which snapshot is the latest one? How do you remove it? Um, this repo is just uh, like a meta repo for the specification and overall, uh, overview where we are but there's a separate repo called ipfs co-host and it's a command line tool which implements this experimental spec uh, you can use it for like co-hosting spe specific websites so it's right now it's for entire websites but it supports lazy mode in which you can uh, you just store the, uh, the sub pages that you actually visited or you actually care about um, and what could someone try to hack on or contribute is uh, submitting a PR to IPFS Companion because this project is not only a command line tool, it should also act as a JS library. So like actually you don't need to implement the spec even. Uh, the library is more or less probably done because it's used by the command line tool. Uh, someone could try to use the same library uh, and simply add user interface to IPFS Companion 
for like adding and removing sites uh, via browser action. Right now in IPFS Companion, uh, there is uh, just uh, a big toggle for pinning. So you just pin entire Wikipedia, hundreds of gigabytes, which is not the best idea, but well. Um, what one could do is to try to replace that, uh, that uh, interface for pinning with something smarter built on top of uh, this library. Yep. Would be really cool. <laughs> one of those projects that are like really cool, but there are other priorities. So, I know. No, it just seems like uh, if we could get the base pieces in place, then other people, uh, content verticals like re event response, uh, and any specific thing like Wikimedia, Wikipedia things like uh, people could run with it if we got these base pieces in place. So maybe maybe I'll do something like maybe I'll I'll make a calendar event for like uh, IPFS Dev Grants Hack Day. So we just like set aside half of a half of a Friday or something like that to write up grants for things like this. Because we didn't, we quite wanted to do that in um, Brooklyn, but we didn't really get time. Yeah, writing a grant takes time. I know, because I wrote, yeah. <laughs> wrote one, and I'm in the process of writing. Oh, I wrote two, yeah. actually. Yeah. Is there a leaderboard? Is there a prize? Yes, there should be. I'm leading, so I, I, I'm asking about the potential prize. <laughs> There, there absolutely should be. Should be. All right. Uh, so I added this next item as well, and this is this is also a request for for this group. Is uh, you know, at Brooklyn we got together and we we talked a little bit about like the specific initiatives that we have in place. Uh, we we have you know things like uh, deprecating WSR, uh, improving connectivity options. We have some things around companion. We have things around supporting our our browser vendor partners. Um, but but what I'd, I'd really like to see, and this kind of goes into planning for Q2 OKR, so Q2 is about a, just a little under a month away, so people should already be starting to think about what that next set of goals are, but what I'd like to actually do is flip it around to even just have like, and I wanted to do this in Brooklyn, and we just really didn't have that, the time or focus, there's so much stuff going on, but I'd love to be able to have like where, what the things like at the end of the year, like, that you have in mind that like where would be a good place for us to be from a browser and connectivity standpoint at the end of the year. What is that sum like that, that total list of things you'd be like, all right, it's December. I feel good because we got all these things. These are the things that we, that we got done this year. I would love to be able to have that list. So I think right, right now we have 13 minutes left. Can you write down some of those things in this, in this item in the HackMD that would be in that list? What would, what would it look like? What would a good, good year look like from a, from a connectivity standpoint, um, from a browser integrations standpoint, um, so that as we go into things like Q2 planning, we can refer back to this list and say, do, do any of these things we're listing as our quarterly OKRs, are they getting us measurably closer to this? And even better would be to say, take this list of things and walk backwards, say, what, what are the things that would be need, we'd need to do for this to actually be possible? What were these things? And we could walk backward, and then what gives you that gives you kind of a loose draft OKR list for the next couple of quarters that gets you to the end of the year. So this idea of really thinking, um, you know, like we, we're I feel like we're moving from a place where some of the fires are now being tended; they're not as on fire anymore. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're really saying, looking forward, like deprecating W star is a thing that is a, very close. Feels like we're soon. We have um, the you know, like new net connectivity options coming up. What does it look like past that? We can actually start to look forward instead of uh, like just being in a place where we're like, oh, we need to, we knew, we know all this stuff needs to change. We just haven't got to it yet. Eventually, we're going to be out of that position, and I want to start to shift the thinking into shooting a little bit farther ahead of where where we are right now, and looking at how we would get get to this that get to that point in a little bit more um, intentional and organized way. So a lot of times we get to QT planning or next quarter OKR planning and we're like, ah, what is, okay, what's the, next, what's the next fire to fight? But instead, I already have a list of things that we're like, these are the places, things that we know we need to do this year and here are the steps that we need to get there. So then we already have Q2, Q3 and Q4. OKR is already pretty much pre-written for us if we have an understanding where we want to be at the end of the year. Does that, does that sound crazy? We are typing. 
type of machines. Oh, uh, uh, wait, is this, is this list going to get too long? <laughs> Should I restrict you to 15 items per person? Hey, these look like good things. I'd say that feel free to stretch too. I mean, like stop and stretch, or also add stretch goals, whichever. You do some yoga there. Hey, no, no yawning, Andrew. It's too early. Ooh, browser nodes don't carry a big crypto bundle with them. The more I learn about that situation, our, our double, maybe even triple encryption. Double rainbow. <laughs> that, that's a really different feeling. <laughs> it's extra secure. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. What about the API versioning? Hmm. <laughs> That's something that really goes across project, right? Yeah. Or is that something that is really specific to browsers? I think oh. it should be more maybe developer experience. Yeah. Hey, we, we have we have one of those people here, Mr. Diaz. Senor Diaz. Hugo. So <laughs> the question? The earlier conversation around API versioning, programmatic API versioning as a developer experience question. Hmm. Because that's not a browser specific thing. That's about stability of the programmatic API across all the different deployed environments. But you want, you want to version the programmatic API? That's hard. We're talking about it. Hmm. We're thinking about it. We get, We'll, we'll love to hear your thoughts. I that, mean, uh, we, we already are versioning like the core interf interface repo. The idea is how can we like expose the version of the package that already exists and make it useful for people who don't want to break anything if that programmatic interface changes. Oh, you can expose the that version from the, the the version command. Yeah, yeah. So like, uh, we already have a protocol version and the daemon version. We could add like the third thing yeah. for yeah. JS ecosystem. Yeah. Kind of picturing a slot machine where you pull it down and it spins through the protocol version, daemon version, and API version. You see where you land. We have a lot of we have a lot of configuration and meta configuration. This came up in some conversations with other collaboration partners as well, where um, uh, it was unclear out of all our configuration stuff what was what was kind of the what were the defaults and what came in out of the box. Hash all the version numbers together. Multi-version. That's it. You add multi in front of anything. You got to go to a different meeting. I'm I'm pretty sure there's no an issue. I'm pretty sure there's an issue about multi-version. Just call it meta version. It needs to be multi. All right. How's this list look? 
kind of interested in like how many of these are nice to have versus must. And then separately, uh, how many of these are like a stretch crazy for, for the year versus like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I already expect to get that done. Should we use uh, random emojis for voting? Random emojis? That way you, you don't know what the vote is. Yeah. Up to your interpretation of what's important. <laughs> I know, I know software development feels like an interpretive dance sometimes, but. I like this P0 stretch. Yeah, the, the DHT stuff. I feel like we can, decision on DHT in the browser is something that's going to happen either way. Actually, that's DHT in JS, not necessarily the browser, right? That's too well, different. yeah. So I think like the DHT in JS is probably going to happen. I would wager that that's going to be the case. DHT running in the web browser, maybe, maybe not so much. But if we can reasonably keep the number of dials required for DHT query down, it becomes more feasible to run a DHT client in the browser. So I think if we can target like, okay, what is the reasonably looking at query times, like backtrack out of that, like what's a reasonable query time, backtrack out of that, figure like what's the maximum number of dials that we could do to stay under that threshold and then see if it's even feasible for us to get the DHT queries under that threshold of connection. So I just put like 20 dials in there, but that is just a random number from my brain and right. it'd be based on real numbers. I, I like that, that, that we do already kind of know, it sounds like you already know what like the bite-sized pieces, the questions that we would need to be able to answer to see if that's a feasible thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe that, that's something. Having DHT nodes that are actually dialable from the browser. <laughs> That's another tricky problem. We'll add it to the list. There you go. Great. This is an awesome start. Thanks, y'all. I really appreciate your, your thinking on this. And then we'll use this as a reference when we go into Q2 planning, which is start pretty soon. So start thinking about what's, what's coming next and, and think about what are the pieces that would lead us to these things as end states by the end of the year. And what we'll do is when we start to do the Q2 planning is kind of look at what the set of OKRs that people have drafted and are proposing and then um, maybe even just like link them to this list and, and Lytle from a kind of browser or and connectivity organization standpoint, maybe it's worth filing issues for each one of these if there aren't already, and then which there probably are, and then <laughs> and then then um, making sure that we're tracking against those issues in each one of the OKR lists to which one of these that that the effort would support. And eventually, then we'll just z Zen have the hell out of it in Jacob Jake style. Yeah. Uh on my to do list, if I'm updating uh, README of uh, in web browsers. Yep. <laughs> but it will yes. happen eventually. <laughs> uh, totally. Uh, we, we should uh, start uh, leveraging Zenhub probably as soon as I get myself uh, from underneath. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm going to do what I can to make that easier too. Like I th for the, it was my goal for, you know, the, we had these special interest groups kind of spun up this quarter. But next quarter, we're entering that quarter with these groups already kind of launched and running. Um, so I wanted to be able to have Q2 really be the kind of line in the sand where we start using the same methods that you're using for for, the, for test ground and content routing and things like that and have some uniformity and consistency from across the team and how we're tracking this type of work. Are we having like a separate uh, Zen, Zen Hub board per uh, special interest group or for entire No, I system? think for per group. Really, because there's just like, yeah, I think it yeah. would make a lot more sense. I don't think for the 
the whole ecosystem one would just be too high level and they cross those too many streams. Each one of these groups are pretty self-contained in the set of work, even though sometimes they relate, um, they can run pretty independently. And I think the team needs a full view of, of just their stuff. And then, then maybe we have an ecosystem one that's just towards all these, all these uh, OKR end of year meta issues or something like that. Yeah, I, I've run into similar problems with like defining uh, uh, back in the time when we were using Waffle instead of uh, Zenboard um, uh, for sort of like high level view of where browser things. The, the moment you include like JS IPFS and JS IPFS HTTP clients on top of those like meta repos, it instantly gets uh, too noisy. So uh, the special interest group uh, level sounds cool. about right. Yeah. Alrighty, we're at time. Oh, just yes, one of the best are. hours of the week. Bye. See you all. Bye. See you next week.